It's good to be together, study God's word uh, as we start another week. Uh, today I'm going to look at the passage in Timothy, the second letter of Timothy, uh, chapter one, and, and refer you to a particular verse. And it's a verse about not being afraid, uh, not just personally being afraid, but of course the Church of Jesus not being afraid, uh, society not being afraid, uh, because there's so much fear uh, at the moment. Fear that if you don't wear a mask, might you pass the disease on to someone, fear that they might have it if they cough anywhere near you. Uh, there's a whole bunch of fears and what will happen if I'm uh, visiting an elderly grandparent or see an older person in the street. If they trip up and fall over, should I help them? Or in helping them, will I give them COVID? Oh gosh, there's so many questions in people's minds. A lot of it driven by uh, fear. Um, some of it real, COVID certainly a horrible virus, and, but some of, it, some of it driven by a massive exaggeration of the nature of risk. But whatever the reason, uh, fear abounds in society at the moment. Over a hundred times in the Bible, we're encouraged not to be afraid. Fear not, do not fear, do not be afraid. Uh, it, it's as if God doesn't want us to live with this burden uh, of anxiety constantly consuming us. And this is particularly true in the passage we're going to look at uh, today. Now, the central verse is this, please let me read it to you, uh, and then talk a bit about how we get to the verse from the verses beforehand. Paul's letter to Timothy, the second one, chapter one and verse seven. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. What some of the older translations ends with is power and love and a sound mind. Now we'll explore in a minute the relationship between having a sound mind, which is a brilliant idea, uh, and self-discipline. They don't seem the same thing in English, uh, but I'll try and explain why the translations vary um, at that point. Earlier on in this chapter, Paul pays tribute to the quality of man Timothy is because of a really excellent upbringing. He pays tribute to uh, grandma and mum for spirituality, which has clearly invested itself in Timothy's life. The value of strong family life remains as true today as it was in the first century. I have been reminded, Paul says, of the sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. However, as many people, preachers long before me, have made clear, God has no grandchildren. And by that we mean um, God doesn't simply take us and say, well, your grandparents were good people, so I'll assume you're going to be good too. Um, Paul doesn't actually do that. He, he pays tribute to the grandparenting, parenting role. It was clearly formative for Timothy. Do remember to thank God for your parents if they were significant in your life and grandparents. I know that for me, the Gork Roger family, going back many generations, was very, very significant indeed in terms of their Christian commitment. I know I live in the good of generation after generation that loved the Lord and wanted to serve him. And of course, I owe my parents um, a huge debt in terms of shaping my moral values and framework, introducing me to Jesus and throughout my life, encouraging me to follow him. However, in addition to that family blessing, Paul says to Timothy, so stir up, this is the next verse, stir up the gift that's in you. It's really important that you embrace this faith, Timothy. It's not just something your mum and dad had, or your mum anyway, and your grandma. You must embrace it yourself. Stir up this gift. Remember, I laid hands on you. I, I tried to bless you with God's presence. Don't, don't neglect that. It's, it's your faith as well as theirs. It's a great reminder that uh, in this uh, lockdown time around the Western world, perhaps most of the world, um, the institutional structures which have supported faith in the past, church services, discipleship groups, home groups, Bible studies of one kind or another, though some of them are happening in some form on the internet, 
the sheer relational strength of actually meeting face to face has been absent for many, many months now. And what that means is that those props, those supporting things to our faith, to some extent have been stripped away a bit by lockdown. And it's left many of us exposed. And it's shown, and I've seen this sadly in Christian leaders as well as uh, church members and those who would describe themselves as ordinary Christians, um, that without those props, those church activity supports, faith becomes a bit wobbly and a bit insecure. And so the great reminder from this part of Timothy is we better get our act together as uh, lockdown continues. And, and here in the UK, uh, we've gone into reverse, really. We were easing out of lockdown during the summer and, and now, um, partly motivated by uh, the number of tests, which are indicating uh, apparent rise in COVID cases and, uh, and the hysteria, which is uh, present in the media about every rise uh, in, in cases, very hard to find measured mature analysis of the situation. Um, and so we are being pushed back. Uh, some of us feel unnecessarily, others of us feel very necessarily, um, into more lockdown. So the more that happens and the more the institutional props of relationships face to face with others, discipling us, helping us, supporting us, are removed, the more it's important that our own faith, our personal faith, is nurtured and strengthened ourselves. Or to use Paul's word to Timothy, stir up the gift that's within you. So my brothers and sisters, as you watch this, there was a day you gave your life to Jesus Christ. It may have been dramatic as an adult, it may have been unbelievably gradual, imperceptibly growing through your childhood if you came from a Christian home and family. But however it came, that gift lies within you, the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes someone a believer, we know. That's not attendance at church, not a commitment to a series of rules or philosophical values. It's a relationship with God's Son, Jesus Christ. That being said, how are we going to support that, strengthen it ourselves? I'm pretty confident that as this next year unfolds and we slowly, hopefully, get back to some sort of openness in society, we're going to have to keep on emphasising self-feeding for the Christian. Because in the absence of some of these church activities, we mustn't let our faith either grow cold or flabby and weak like an underused muscle. So I urge you, today to think about ways of stirring up the gift within you. We are followers of Jesus. How can we strengthen that? Many of us are on our own more than ever before in terms of this faith journey. How can we be strengthened in it? Let's ask the Holy Spirit to fill us with his love and power and self-control, as this next verse says. Let's ask for his anointing, his blessing upon us personally, not to lose sight of face to face with him. Our view of God can easily become obscured or dim without the personal supports we've become so used to through other people over the years. I don't know if you've noticed this. If you're out and about or in a shop and, and you happen to be wearing a mask or somebody else is wearing a mask, it's not easy to recognise people, even your friends. You have to do a double take. You see their hair, maybe, or their eyes, or you recognise a piece of clothing. It, it, it's just a bit trickier for instant recognition than when their face is uncovered. For many, sadly, I knew stories about how God appears to be masked to so many. You can't quite recognise him in his actions in the world. It all seems a bit harder to grasp because his face appears to be hidden. And so the challenge today is to stir up this gift and to do everything we can through prayer and the fellowship we can gain on the internet or with individuals where we can meet them to talk and to pray, perhaps developing a prayer partnership or a prayer triplet, intentionally saying, 
We can meet in a group of up to six in our home. Maybe we should do it. Maybe we should intentionally pray more with others. Who's hurting? Who's struggling? Who do we know who's not quite getting it together spiritually? Whose face getting cold? How can we embrace them? What can we do to build hope and boldness and a new clarity in their lives about their faith? So that's something we really ought to be doing to make sure that we and others keep seeing the face of God with crystal clarity. So Paul says to Timothy, listen, you're not supposed to be afraid. Timothy is a bit of a, a, a timid soul, uh, perhaps suffering from a few uh, health issues. Obviously, there's some concern about an upset uh, tummy, maybe digestive tract problems. Paul tells him uh, to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake. There's clearly something going on there. And Timothy doesn't seem to be the most confident, the most outgoing of personalities. So Paul says, look, you don't have to have a spirit of fear, Timothy, because it, it's not you. you you're, you're not the one doing this. You're, you're an ambassador. You're a vehicle of God's love and power. And so today, we, timid Timothys, so many of us, need to be praying for power. The government seems all powerful at the moment. The state is reaching its tentacles into every area of life. Uh, many of us feel completely inappropriately, but it's happening. Reaching their tentacles into family life, pushing apart children, grandchildren, pushing apart colleagues and neighbours and friends who can't, apart from a distant wave, engage each other. Telling churches how they can meet, whether or not they can sing, answer no. The state appears to be unbelievably powerful. So we have to keep reminding ourselves that the great power of the universe, greater than the power of the state, is ultimately the power of the living God. And that's the power which deposited in us through the Holy Spirit lives within us. And we have to realise that through our prayers, that's more powerful than any government diktat, any military army, any political party. The power of the living God remains active and the gates of hell itself won't prevail against that power. So be confident today, even if things look bleak on the power front, that there is a greater power still, a power we don't see much of in action perhaps, but that power is still real. Let's pray for it to be unleashed. Or in the great prayer of Isaiah, uh, in chapter 64, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. So we're praying for God, intervene in your power. That power is in us, of course, by the Spirit. But it's not a power like a nuclear explosion, the power of a violent fist, the power to destroy. It's a power which is exercised in the next word, power and love. And that's crucial. Because what we're finding now, particularly as uh, lockdowns are reimposed in parts of Europe particularly, is that there's dissent emerging. The first lockdown was accepted mainly without a whimper. Uh, personally, I had hoped for a much greater sense of outcry, but the, there wasn't that, and, and I've had to live with disappointment in a way. Um, that we've been so acquiescent uh, to these uh, pressures. But however we feel about that, there is a changing mood. Church leadership has recently been admitting publicly that we were wrong to agree so easily to closing our church buildings. There's a mood about that we just can't do this lockdown thing again and again and again forever uh, because there are um, quite clear quite clear downsides to lockdown, which I've mentioned dozens of times in the course of these vlogs. Some official statistics were released this week, actually, which show beyond the shadow of a doubt that more people are dying and will die as a result of lockdown globally and in the Western world and in our own country, the United Kingdom, than are going to die from the coronavirus as things stand. So we have different views on this. 
One of the newspapers this morning uh, was encouraging the Prime Minister to go further. Lock us down now. Take away all our freedoms. Uh, I'm not exaggerating. That's exactly what they were saying. Uh, others are saying it's a step too far. This is crazy. It's ridiculous. And so there's dissent. Now, how will that dissent be felt? It will mean that your neighbours might be in one or two extreme of the two extreme camps. They might want more lockdown and be frightened, and they might be angry at what's been done and therefore want more liberty. So it's love that covers that. So although we should and must express the views that we feel on behalf of the poor and the broken and those for whom lockdown is deeply painful, many of us are in comfortable settings protected from the worst of it. So we must be agitating. However, when we come across people with a different view, our job is to be filled with the love of God towards them and to be caring. There is no place for angry bigotry, for uh, aggressive behaviour, for negativity. That's not Christ expressed on earth. So power, yes, but love is crucial. And then it says you need a sound mind or some versions self-discipline or self-control. And that's, you see, because... If your mind is turbulent and disturbed with all this news and ideas and what can we do and what can't we do now and fearfulness about upsetting people and those are real concerns. We need a mind which is sane and balanced. We do know that there's been an explosion of mental health problems through lockdown. Stresses of a variety of kinds, people with genuine mental illness, made much worse, and those who normally would not feel some of the heat and burden of mental stress, moving into areas in which their anxiety levels are rising exponentially. So, a sound mind. You may need to stay away from the news for a while in order to stay focused on God and his word and on the good news of his eternal presence. If you're being made to feel anxious by watching the news all the time or reading the papers or looking on the internet for the latest scare story, I urge you to get your mind focused on the things that matter, on God's love for you, on the certainty and unchanging nature of the word, of love for those in your family and those around you, of the fact that almost certainly you've got enough food to eat. And even though today we've had the absurdity of going back to stockpiling toilet paper and stockpiling pasta and, and shops running out of milk and all of that kind of thing, let's not participate in that madness. A sound mind, a mature approach, a balanced, gentle, unflappable spirit that is self-disciplined and doesn't give way to wild thoughts about what might or might not happen. Don't give in to that. The devil would love it to put everybody, the whole country, in a great funk of emotional angst. Don't give in to it. So this week, as you study this passage in 2 Timothy, enjoy the certainty of a timid man being strengthened by an old apostle who wants to encourage him about his faith in God. Praise God for Timothy's family life. Praise God for Timothy's personal faith. Praise God that he can, by the grace of God, have a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. May your freedom from fear be strong this week and may you pass that on in powerful, loving ways to your family and friends, to neighbours, and even to the casual acquaintance you bump into in the shop or the bank or on the street, that society will have thousands of individual Christians living without fear. In Jesus' name, Amen.